from the speakers, please, sir. Hi, everybody. We're about to start, so if you would grab your seats. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Welcome back. That was a fantastic talk from both Carter and Rick, and a great way to realize how special it is that we have wolves in Yellowstone and what they mean to people. And we have, you'll, you'll see two new members of the panel up here. This is Carol Miller, the only woman up there. She's with the 06 Legacy. And Mark Cook from Wolves of the Rockies. They will each have um, 10 or 15 minutes to speak, and then what we're going to do is open this up to question and answers to all four members of the panel and myself. Um, but first, before I bring Carol down, um, I want to read a piece from, uh, this is an excerpt from my blog. <coughs> my... Uh, intent here, uh, I've been asked to explain my connection with Yellowstone, and of course, Yellowstone, being in Yellowstone was a life-changing experience for me. It uh, led me to write two books. Both of them are bestsellers and award-winning, but that's not the important thing is. The important thing is that people read them, and it transports them to Yellowstone. Many people, I get lots of mail, many people who have never been to Yellowstone, that's their experience is through those books. And it makes me understand how important wolves are. Yellowstone's wolves, of course. But for me, uh, over the years, what I've come to see is it's not just Yellowstone wolves, it's wolves all across the lower 48. So this piece relates to the future of Yellowstone's wolves, but also all of those in the lower 48. I write a lot about wolves. I read a lot about wolves. Recently, I reread Brett Walker's book, The Lost Wolves of Japan. Walker tells the story of how Japan went from wolf worship to wolf eradication. Reading the book this time, I found myself wondering how the attitudes and actions toward wolves by Montana, my home state, Wyoming, Idaho, and by the federal government compare with the attitudes and actions that drove wolves to extinction in Japan. The story begins around 1600 when Japanese grain farmers regarded wolves as deities and worshipped them at shrines. That changed in 1868 when a new Japanese government vowed to modernize the country's economy. As part of that modernization, Japan would create a large-scale livestock industry, similar to industrial ranching in the U.S. And as in the U.S., wolves had to go. In 1873, the Japanese government hired an American rancher, Edwin Dunn, to help build the livestock industry and to eradicate wolves. Dunn knew how to use rifles, traps, poisons, and biological agents. When Dunn arrived, Japan's war on wolves erupted. By 1905, just 32 years later, wolves were extinct in Japan. Now, reading this book again, I found myself thinking, what did Japan do then that we are doing now? And how does that impact wolves in Yellowstone and the rest of the U.S.? A couple points that Japan did. First, Japan's government wrote policies and laws that led to the eradication of wolves. In the U.S., of course, the best legal protection for wolves is the Endangered Species Act. But the current administration wants to remove ESA protection from all gray wolves in the lower 48 except the Mexican wolf, red wolf. 
But even if wolves remain ESA protected, the McKittrick policy reduces their protection. This policy evolved from a 1995 Montana case in which Chad McKittrick was convicted under the Endangered Species Act for killing wolf number 10, one of the first wolves released into nearby Yellowstone. McKittrick argued that he was not guilty because he thought he was shooting a wild dog. He appealed his conviction, but he lost. Now, although the Department of Justice prevailed, they adopted what became known as the McKittrick policy. That directs Department of Justice attorneys to not prosecute unless they could prove that the accused knowingly killed a protected species. That policy is why hunters who kill federally protected gray wolves dispersing to Iowa, Colorado, and the Grand Canyon were not prosecuted. The shooters claimed to have misidentified the wolves as coyotes. Japan's government also used bounties to overwhelm centuries-old reverence and make wolves more valuable dead than alive. We have begun doing the same here. For instance, Idaho hunters and trappers who kill wolves legally can be reimbursed up to $1,000 per dead wolf. The organization paying this bounty claims that wolves have decimated Idaho's elk herd. However, statistics from the Idaho Department of Fish and Game show that the statewide elk harvest now is similar to the harvest prior to the reintroduction of wolves. The same organization is trying right now, this very week, to get a bill passed in Montana that would make a bounty system legal there. Japan's government hammered home the message that wolves were demons to destroy, not deities to worship. We have similar messages here. The message in 85% of Wyoming, wolves are vermin to be shot on sight. The message in Idaho, more wolves must die. Idaho state government committed to spending $2 million, most of it taxpayer money, over a five-year period to fund what's called the Idaho Wolf Depredation Control Board. That money is spent only on lethal methods. None of the non-lethals that we had such a great discussion about yesterday. And in fiscal year 2018, Wildlife Services was paid to kill 83 Idaho wolves. That's in addition to the 312 that hunters and trappers killed. As of February, that board, which was temporary, became permanent. Japan's government built the need to abolish wolves into the country's education system. Today, more than a century after eradication, the challenge to wolf reintroduction in Japan is changing those attitudes back. Now, our federal government does little to educate about the value of wolves. We should have a national curriculum to teach how little risk wolves present and how much ecological benefit they provide. Curriculums can dispel common myths and prejudices and encourage youth to get involved. Curriculums already exist. The National Geographic and Living with Wolves have produced an excellent curriculum. Even the little uh, all-volunteer conservation agency that I'm a part of in Gardner, the Bear Creek Council, we help fund a curriculum that's in use in Montana schools. I'm, actu I'm actually frightened by the similarities between the eradication of wolves in Japan and our current local and national attitudes and actions towards wolves. I don't, I'm not going to stand up in front of you here today and, think, and tell you I think wolves will become extinct in the United States because I don't think they will. But what I do see is much more killing on the horizon. Given this, I believe that we wolf advocates must be in the fight for the long haul to reshape attitudes 
and to protect wolves in Yellowstone because remember, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, they just surround that little island that we call Yellowstone. But this event, all of you, gives me hope. I have hope that you will go home and educate your families and your friends to the importance and the essentialness of wolves. I have hope that you will speak at public hearings, commission meetings. That's my biggest hope, quite honestly. And I hope that we will join forces to fight this for the long haul, because it is a long haul. So now, I want to uh, introduce Carol Miller, who is the founder and director of the 06 Legacy, and I'll let Carol tell you all about herself. All, all, only thing I want to add is, she really impresses me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to be here and meet all of you. Is this sound okay? Am I? Seems kind of. Is it okay? Okay. Anyway, honored to be here. Honored to meet everybody. Um, guess, guess where I was last year? I was right here. Guess where I was sitting? Right there. And I met all these amazing wolf advocates who were out there doing so many amazing things on the front lines of wolf advocacy. And I thought, you know what? I got to go out and do something myself. Oh, I forgot to turn the thing. Okay, what happened? Okay, so here I am meeting a lot of the people you see here. And then I went out to the PAC meet and greet and I mentioned it to Loki. And he said, <laughs> with just his look, you know what? You better go take action. So I went home and I got to work. So I founded the Facebook page, The 06 Legacy, with seven other dedicated wolf advocate friends. We launched just in September. We do daily posts all about Yellowstone wolves and packs. We tell their stories their history, we share wolf news and calls to action. And in six months, we have over 60,000 followers and continuing to grow. And you know why that is? Because people love wolves and people love Yellowstone wolves. So we didn't stop there. We wanted to go further in our advocacy, so we started the 06 Legacy nonprofit and website. And our mission is to educate, raise public awareness, and then make legislative change. We launched that just last month. We're a 501c4 nonprofit. We believe that political activism is the way to make change for wolves. We're working to reduce wolf quotas and get it, implement a no wolf hunt zone around Yellowstone Park. And we created a video of 06 and 926 that will be shown for the first time here later in the program. We've been quoted in major news publications. Um, so let this conference inspire and motivate you to take action. Where is that inspiration going to take you? Um, wolves need you more than ever, and we'll see why. At the end of 1994, there were 48 wolves in northern Montana. In 1995 and 1996, 60, 66 wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone and central Idaho. From 1995 to 2009, times were good for wolves. They were protected by the Endangered Species Act. Their population grew, and they expanded their territory throughout the northern Rocky Mountains, the Pacific Northwest, and even into California. In 2009, the US Fish and Wildlife Service decided that wolves had recovered in the region, and they drew lines to delist wolves in the areas of Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, a third of Washington, a third of Oregon, and a little part of Utah. I'm going to just talk about the three states surrounding the park, Montana, Idaho, and Utah, since this is Yellowstone Day. Delisting meant grave danger for wolves. The good times and the prosperity were now gone. In 2009, that same year, wolves were delisted in Idaho and Montana, but not Wyoming. Wyoming's wolf management plan was rejected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so they remained in, on the endangered species list. <coughs> that year, the hunting began and we started killing. 253 wolves were killed that first year. In 2010, a court order put wolves back on the endangered species list, and what do you see? 
When they're protected, they live. When they're delisted, they die. In 2011, Congress delisted wolves in Idaho and Montana. That was the first time Congress legislatively, legislatively has delisted uh, an endangered species. In 2012, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delisted wolves in Wyoming, even though their population was only estimated to be about 328 wolves, which was far less than Idaho or Montana. Wyoming now took over management of the wolves, and they opened almost the entire state to unconditional killing. 66 wolves were killed that year in Wyoming, and the deaths increased. 2013, all three states hold wolf hunts. 2014, courts put Wyoming's wolves back on the Endangered Species Act because the kill on site policy what didn't, wasn't appropriate for, for conservation, so they put them back on the endangered species list, but not before 12 wolves were killed in the predatory zone. They weren't put on until September, so between January and September, 12 wolves were still killed. In 2015, Idaho and Montana held hunting seasons, and the killing continues. 2016, another 475. You notice a pattern? In 2017, the U.S. Court of Appeals delisted Wyoming wolves, and so now all three states remain unprotected. In 2018, it was a record killing year. 707 wolves were killed in those three states. So let's look at the percentage of wolves that are killed by hunting and trapping as compared to the population. In Idaho, 312 wolves were killed in 2018. Idaho doesn't even count individual wolves anymore. They just count packs. So nobody really knows exactly for sure how many wolves are there. I saw an article in um, the Olympian that estimated it to be 90 packs, and a typical wolf pack in, in Idaho has about six to nine wolves. So if you take that forward, the population's around 540 to 810. So that means 39 to 58% of the wolf population was killed in 2018 in Idaho. Same thing with Montana. 315 wolves were killed in 2018. I called Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and their estimate was 800. So if you do that math, it's another about 39%. I'm not going to do, I'll talk about Wyoming later, but let's just look at the big picture. All three states, 707 wolves killed in 2018. The wolf population is estimated to be 1,600 to 2,000 from what I've seen. It's a huge part of the, the, you know, the bottom line is it's a huge portion of the population is getting killed each year through hunting and trapping. So if we look at the big picture now and look at all the hunting and trapping from 2009 to 2018, Idaho's killed over 2,500 wolves, Montana over 800, uh, 1,800, and Wyoming almost 300. Grand total of over 4,600 wolves have died since the, you know, they first became delisted in 2009. Now if we look at what's happening over time, year to year, you can see that things aren't getting any better for wolves. They're getting killed more and more over time. It's increasing. It's not just hunting and trapping uh, that's causing wolves to die. There's also the lethal control actions that are performed by the state on the behalf of the agriculture industry. If we look at the lethal control actions that were done from 2009 to 2017, there's 644 in Idaho, 676 wolves lost their lives in Montana, and 443 in Wyoming. Over 1,700 wolves were killed through control actions during that time. If you look at that year to year, you can see about 200 wolves on average are killed per year by this, authorized by the states. That's twice the population of wolves in Yellowstone are being killed under lethal control actions by the state. Well, why are the states doing that? This is a landmark study that just came out. You have to excuse me. I have a typo here. I think I typed 2009 too many times. This is actually 2019. It just came out just a month ago, or this month, from Humane Society US. If you look at cattle depredation from wolves, you can see that the amount of depredation is tiny. It's minuscule, right? Wolf depredations on cattle are rare. If you do the same thing for the sheep from that report, look how small those are. So why are we killing so many wolves through lethal control when the, the depredation is so small? Now if we look at since 2009, we put everything together, hunting, trapping, lethal control. Over 5,700 wolves have been killed since 2009. 
about 638 wolves every year in those three states. Let's look for a minute at Idaho. We're going to talk about the Lolo Zone. This just happened last month. The elk herds in the state weren't meeting the objective in the Lolo Zone. So seven wolves were killed by Idaho. Why? To improve elk survival for human hunters. Well, if you look at the elk tag quotas, Idaho, Idaho has um, elk tags available for residents. They have elk tags available for non-residents. So how many elk tags are available for everybody? Over a thousand. So they have over a thousand elk tags available for people to kill elk, but they killed seven wolves because the elk herds weren't as big as they wanted. In Idaho and other places, they use helicopters and sharpshooters to gun down wolves. This is a USDA Wildlife Services plane out of Idaho. Notice the paw prints on the side of the plane. Those represent, every, each one is a wolf that was killed by the crew. They wear it on the plane like a badge of honor. So you can see it truly is a war on wolves out there. Let's look at Montana for a minute. There's a record, har record harvest in Montana last year. 315 wolves were killed. That's 24% more than were killed in 2017. Now, if you look at Montana, there's a vast amount of land available to, to um, hunt wolves. All that green is available. You can go hunt wolves anywhere in there. And there's three small quota zones. We're going to look at the two quota zones here at the bottom of the picture. If you blow that up, you can see 313 and 316. Those are the two quota zones that border the northern boundary of Yellowstone. And when Yellowstone wolves cross that border, they can be hunted. So 2009 to December 2018, 37 Yellowstone wolves were shot by hunters. Of those wolves, 80% of them were killed in those two units. So what do we do? Well, we're trying to close those units to hunting. We're trying to get a no wolf, zone, no wolf zone implemented there so that we can stop the killing of Yellowstone wolves. Now let's look at Wyoming. You can see that Wyoming in blue is the control actions and red is the harvest. Now, Wyoming doesn't have as many har uh, uh, hunting and trapping seasons because they were on the Endangered Species Act, but if you look at it in total, you can see that Wyoming kills twice as many wolves in control actions as in hunting and trapping. So now we're going to look at that population percentage here because if I looked at the population percentage in just hunting and trapping, it would only have been the red bar. So we're going to look over here and put the hunting and trapping and the control actions as a total and now look at the percentage. 138 wolves were killed. As of 12-31-2017, the population was estimated to be 347 wolves. So 39% of the population was killed through hunting control, hunting, trapping, and, and lethal control. And if you look at Wyoming, kind of the same picture we had in Montana, the Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks, wolves are protected. They can't be hunted. Just outside of there is a quota zone where there's limited hunting. The whole rest of Wyoming is called, I forgot to put the quota zone up there, it's called the predatory zone. In that zone, wolves can be killed at any time, in any way, 24-7, 365 days a year because they're considered vermin. Their life doesn't matter. They just get rid of them. So wolves that leave Yellowstone National Park through natural dispersal to establish new territory, join packs, form their own packs, they're at great risk of human-caused mortality, as you've seen. And Yellowstone National Park wolves who live in the park are also in grave danger when they leave the border and pass into the other states. Just in 2018, five Yellowstone wolves were killed outside the boundary of the park. Five were killed and one was injured. Now if you look at that picture, two of them were alphas, and one of them was a matriarch of her family. So three leaders of their families were taken by hunting. You can see that five packs were affected by the hunting. Five packs lost one of their valuable members. And you can see that the hunting in this particular year took place in Montana and Wyoming. So now I want to show you what 06 has to say. She's our namesake, and this is her story. 
I click it? Okay. Okay, now it knows now. I was born to be a leader. So when the time was right, I left my birth pack to start my own. One day, I saw two brothers straying from their pack. I howled to summon them. When I saw them up close, I knew I wanted these fellows to be my pack mates. One of them was called 755M. He and I would become our new PAX Alphas. I was an exceptional hunter and provided well for my pack. I was a good protector too. I had three litters and every one of my pups survived their first year, which is extraordinary. One of my pups was 926F. She always had her mom's spirit. In the valley, we are used to humans and are unafraid of them. They stare at us through their scopes and cameras. It was a tough winter in 2012, and my pack headed east looking for food. We crossed some kind of boundary we couldn't see. I heard the sound of a dying cottontail rabbit. But there was no rabbit, only a human. And we thought we had no reason to fear humans. My whole pack mourned for me. I'm so proud of my daughter, 926F. I watched her grow up and grow up strong. She would go on to succeed me as the alpha female of the Lamar Canyon pack. But in 2018, she left the park just as I had done six years before. Her pack mourned for days. My descendants are still in the valley. They need your help. All the wolves of Yellowstone need your help. Not quite. Do I still have time for an ending? Am I done then? Okay. Okay. I had a closing, but I'll save that for talking to you in person at the booth. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so the next speaker is Mark Cook, founder and president of Wolves of the Rockies. I just want to say one thing about uh, Mark. As a Montana resident and a Montana wolf advocate, I couldn't be happier to have Mark Cook living in Montana. He is at Helena during the legislative session almost the whole time. The few times that I get up there, it's a six hour round trip for me. It's a six hour round trip for him. He's always there. The few times I get up there, there's Mark. So with that, I would just welcome to the stage Mark Cook. Oh, so I learned a lesson today. Don't follow Carol, <laughs> okay? Because a lot of the things I was going to touch on, Carol nailed. 
which is great. I'm very fortunate to be here. I'm, it's been really rough these last couple months. And as much as you people come here and speak and listen, I need to be around you people to recharge my soul, to get back into the fight, which will start Monday. So what I'd like to talk about briefly is what's going on. Well, let me talk about my organization. I'm very fortunate we're all we're a nonprofit. We've been going for about 10 years now. I've been engaged for 15 years. I have colleagues, um, Kim Beam, who is now, fortunately, this is good news, she's in Colorado, so she's going to start working in Colorado. And Kim is going to, for the first time ever, we're going to start reaching into Wyoming. Now, that's not promising in the sense that we are going to get what we want. But the thing is, the other side has always been getting what they want, and they've been unopposed. And Kim, being in Montana, is going to experience all the same things. Or Kim, being in Colorado, will experience all the same rhetoric that she experienced in Montana. So she'll have good arguments prepared for Colorado and when she gets into Wyoming. And I find there's one thing that most haters dislike more than wolves, and that's people like you and I that are willing to step up to the plate and say, hey, this is wrong. So I'd like to talk to you briefly. Our organization is nonprofit. We have no salary employees. So when donations are made, they go to where they should be going. And I'm, I'm not putting down other organizations. I'm just saying that we're doing this out of passion and because it's the right thing to do. Um, let's talk a little bit about Helena. Folks, I don't know what's going on. I thought we were actually over this. In the last legislative session in um, 2017, there was maybe one or two bad wolf bills. And for the most part, we managed to kill them. This year, they've been coming left and right. I would say there's probably seven or eight bills that are bad. Um, and the amazing thing is the good bills, like Mike Phillips, Senator Mike Phillips, who uh, Carter talked about earlier, who was involved with the Yellowstone program. And the last I knew, Mike was with um, the Turner program. Uh, he's the senator for Bozeman. He put a bill forward called SB 185. And we had a great showing. And what the bill was, was to protect Yellowstone wolves in 313. And these are management areas. 313 and 316, which border Yellowstone. Carol, to her credit, flew in and spoke in, um, in favor of this bill, as did most of the national and local organizations. Rick was there. Mary was there. Um, so there was a lot of pro-wolf people there. Um, there was some anti-wolf, but, but for the most part, one of those few times there was more pro-wolf people there speaking in support of the bill. The bill died, I think it was um, nine to one. And I will say one thing. The one person that voted to support Mike's bill to protect Yellowstone wolves was a woman. They seem to have the courage to do what's right. So if you care, you need to be there. You need to speak up for these critters. There's only one reason we have areas near Yellowstone with quotas for Yellowstone wolves, 313 and 316. And of course, we're the tip of the spear, but you're the force behind it. If you people come forward, call these senators, call these representatives, and tell them what you want and what you feel is right, and especially your young people. The young people need to get engaged. There's nothing more humbling than to have an, a nine-year-old girl walk in and say, this has got to stop. This is, my, this is my future. I don't want this. 
for some reason, it takes all the wind out of the decision makers that oppose um, anything positive for wolves. So you had House Bill or Senate Bill 185. We now are going back to the bounty days. We're trying to, well, let me back up a little bit. You have a group called Foundation for Wildlife Management, and it's anything but that, very deceptive title. And they receive a great deal of funding from Rocky Mountain Health Foundation. Foundation for Wildlife Management is in Idaho, Sandpoint, Idaho. And Rocky Mountain Health is headquartered out of Missoula, Montana. Last I knew they were receiving $25,000 a year. And what it is, is this, organi this organization figures out where they believe elk populations are low. And what they're doing is they're paying people, mostly trappers, to go into these areas and kill wolves where they believe the population is low. So what I'm telling you is, under the public trust doctrine, wildlife belongs to everybody. And it should be managed or mismanaged by the state, the wildlife agencies. And what you're seeing is these groups are taking it upon themselves with funding from national groups to privatize wildlife management. So what's going on is, although Foundation for Wildlife Management can operate in Idaho because of their laws, Montana has a hang up on it. We don't like bounties. Bounties are outlawed years ago. So what they're trying to do is they're pushing a bill forward now called House Bill 279. And what that will do is essentially make bounty hunting legal. I would really be grateful if you would hit one of our pages and contact the Senate. It's on the floor, it'll probably be read one day. There's gonna be some adjustments made to the bill, but we're right around the 50-50 point and we need, that, we need that nudge from individuals like that you that care. And I think we can kill this bill either on the second or third reading. If we don't, what's gonna happen is Foundation for Wildlife Management is gonna come to Montana and they are gonna do privatization of wildlife management. And that doesn't involve more elk being killed. It's gonna be more wolves. As Carol said, 315 wolves were killed in Montana this year. Well, what they're not telling you is that 46 were killed by Wildlife Service Control Acts. Yellowstone 313 and 316 have the highest poaching rate of wolves killed in Montana. So then you have wolf on wolf mortality. The number I'm hearing, and it's a little bit off from Carol's, is 851 wolves. I don't believe that to begin with. I'm telling you the number is lower. But let's just run with that number because that's the agency number. 851 wolves. Between wolf on wolf mortality, poisoning, poaching, wildlife service control actions, what was killed during the hunting and trapping season, we killed almost half the wolves in Montana. The number I'm hearing, and this is just from whispers, is 350 wolves in Montana. If we can drive that number down to 350 wolves, we will surely clear the threshold of relisting um, under the ESA, the protection for wolves. We'll have 15 breeding pair and we'll have 150 wolves on the ground in Montana. I honestly don't believe big ag, um, the livestock producers are the problem. 46 animals were killed, 46 wolves, with a 60 depredation cases. So although I don't like that, I understand that. 315 were killed for no reason at all other than hunters want to go out and kill wolves. Trappers want to go out and trap wolves. And if we allow this bounty bill, 279, to go forward, it's sending the wrong picture. Bounties were wrong 100 years ago. They're wrong now. So I'd encourage you, and I can, we can provide the information, 
to make a phone call or send an email. It's really easy to do. Some people, there's been some discussion on do they want out-of-state vo uh, voices coming in, weighing in on things, or do we not? I personally am of the mind that when out-of-state hunters email FWP to weigh in on something, it's taken into account. But when pro wolf people email in, it's disregarded. They don't want to know about it. So my advice is please, please, please weigh in on these things because the wolves have no other voice. I guess with that, there's there's a couple other bills that if you'd really like to know about, I'd like to, you know, I can explain them to you, what's going on around Yellowstone. The commissioners who make the decisions on protecting wildlife or not protecting wildlife, they are going to meet again for wolves in December. Now, I have a commitment from Carol, I have a commitment from Rick, that we are going to get together and we are going to come up with a plan of attack and have it promoted from a commissioner to kind of change things around. And, and it won't be perfect, but it will mean less wolves die. And one thing I think is very valuable is I, we don't usually, our organization doesn't really attach itself to other groups but we've hooked up with Apex because they checked their eagle at the door. That's the plan B, the eagle's at the door. Carol, who is just jumping into this now, wonderful to work with. Rick, wonderful to work with. We had an opportunity in 2017 at the last um, commissioner's hearing for Wolves. This sets the proposal for the next couple of years. We had an opportunity to knock that number down I had a commissioner on board who said, okay, we can do this. And he wasn't at the commissioner's hearing, but he did a call in. And what happened was none of the other commissioners would jump on board and lower the number to one wolf in each hunting unit. And part of the reason it is for that is because Rick and I weren't talking. And what happened was down in Yellowstone, FWP, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for Montana down in Yellowstone was scaring or using bad tactics with the people in that area saying, you know what, the number is going to go up. The quota is going to go up. It's going to go up to seven or six, six wolves. So because Rick and I weren't talking, he didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what FWP was doing. We could have driven that number down to one wolf in each section. That's changed, ladies and gentlemen. Rick and I are talking. Carol and I are talking. And the change is going to come. It's going to take some time. As hunting dollars decline, revenue decline, which supports the department with Pittman and Robertson and Bingo Johnson money, as that declines and it continues to decline, you folks, the non-consumptive community, for a lack of better words, are going to have more and more input and Remember this, money to an agency is a drug. And when they get used to your money that you have control over, when you, if you don't see things going your way, you can retract. The department's not gonna like that. So they're gonna have to give you influence. So look for bills that are positive in funding state agencies from the non-consumptive viewpoint. It's coming, folks. I think with that funding, we will get a seat at the table, and it's not gonna happen overnight, but gradually, we will increase our influence. And under the public trust doctrine, the wildlife belong to all of us. So why is it the tail wagging the dog? We need to be more engaged. So on that, I'll, I'm gonna show a quick video, and I. I grabbed the wrong video, I made two, and the number was 32 wolves killed from Yellowstone, and it's actually 37 like Carol said. But it's about Spitfire, who we are investigating, who was killed outside the park less, less than a mile. 
we don't believe it was a legal killing. But because of politics and friendships and relationships within the department and that community, it was brushed off and said it was a legal kill. That's not over. We just need some time to play this out. And like I said, with Carol and Rick and us working together, good things are going to happen for Wolf. So, let me just give a little talk. Okay, this is the Lamar King impact. This is Silvergate. This is where the general area that she was killed, 926 Ave. Yeah, go right ahead. No sound? No less than 32 Yellowstone wolves have been killed outside of Yellowstone boundaries since hunting of wolves has been allowed. Also in the two wolf management areas in Montana, 313 and 316 that border Yellowstone have the highest number of wolf poaching incidents that we know of. All of these poaching cases remain unsolved because Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks sees wolves as a nuisance and refuses to put energy into solving them. Now you get to ask your questions to Carter Niemeyer, Carol Miller, Rick McIntyre, and Mark Cook. So please, um, who's got the first question? Uncle Jim! <laughs> I just 
met Uncle Jim. He's not actually my uncle, but it seems to be that's where it's going. <laughs> So I've always loved wolves since I was a kid. Uh, but about 99% of my knowledge of wolves has come over the last few days. Uh, I don't know a lot about the history of, maybe get away from in front of the speaker. I don't know all the history of what went on to the introduction of wolves into the, the states up there. Uh, but it's kind of reminds me of the Middle East that you're never gonna have any lasting uh, protection against wolves unless you keep on fighting every year. Uh, but we also saw a map of where you could reintroduce wolves somewhere else in the country. And if that was to occur, what would you recommend as the steps that must be performed before those wolves are introduced in order to avoid kind of the situation we have in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming? Directed to me. Sure. <laughs> you seem to be the, uh, I think that would be good for you. Yeah. Well, I can stay the right distance. The next predicted battle will be in Colorado. The Rocky Mountain Elk, no, they had to get all these, Rocky Mountain Wolf Project apparently has a campaign going strongly to try to get a referendum, a vote in Colorado where the voters can decide and set the foundation for a wolf reintroduction. And uh, am I on board with that? I'm not sure. Because I think we gotta really fix what's going on in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. Because it's not gonna be any different. People are people, politics are the same. I don't care what state you're in. Uh, Washington and Oregon, are, they're behind Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana in uh, wolf recovery numbers. But the politics are already in action to try to step up the process. Amaru talked about that. And um, the effort again is gonna be, politicians are gonna want to make every effort and every avenue available to kill wolves when the time comes, the sooner the better. So um, focus on Colorado, that's where it's gonna happen. And, and uh, we just finished some workshops I don't even know what day it is anymore, but a week and a half ago or so. And the message was clear. Uh, the people who came to the workshop said, we don't want them, they don't belong here. We have too many people, we don't have enough room for them. Yet they do have 700,000 deer and elk to eat, which tells me there's a lot of places wolves can easily survive. The one thing they did say was, if they get here on their own, we can live with that. We accept that. But that can be a long process. It, can, it could happen this year. There could be a pack there. I mean, one, one outfitter told me that he tra saw tracks of five wolves in the last year traveling together, which tells me maybe there was some breeding activity. But on the other hand, this could be decades, too, because of... Uh, Wolves were eradicated in the 1940s, and wolves were living just across the border from Montana, and it wasn't until about 1985, 45 years later, that a few packs formed right on the boundary of Montana, and the first pack by Glacier was poisoned by people on the Canadian side of the border. So here they are just, uh, you know, 100 miles apart, you might say, to, to cross that line. And it took that long, and, and uh, wolves were already being killed then. So anyway, um, that's kind of where we're at, and, and I'm not on anybody's side yet. I'm just sharing information down there, trying to give people the real perspective of what's going on. Thank you, Carter. Anybody else on the panel want to respond to that question? We're struggling. Although we're behind, we're involved with the uh, with the process. To be blunt with you, if, if we're going to just put them in there to get them killed, what's the sense of having them there? I mean, our our actions are one thing, but they're going to feel, you know, the pain and suffering because of our decisions. So, although at, at the early stages we're 
people engaging or supporting, we still got some thinking to do. I guess I'd just like to say, if you looked at uh, Wyoming, so much of it's predatory zone, so any wolves that make it into Colorado have to pass through that, so the ones that make it in there should really be celebrated. Another question? I'm gonna cheat, I have two questions. Um, <laughs> Stop and cheat. <laughs> <laughs> These are both possibly short-term solutions, but I'm wondering what what kind of length and mileage are we talking about this, this horrible, these two hunting units where most of the wolves are dying along the Yellowstone border? Can, can we set up an artificial boundary there with some kind of deterrence <laughs> that, that can uh, detect the collars that, that the wolves wear, or even a human border for that matter? I, I don't know the length that we're talking about here, that would be the question. Is this a possibility? Can we do this? Okay. Is it just a matter of funding? And the other question is, can we hire private investigators to invest the poaching? Okay, so Mark, you want to start with the, the I cave? I, it's pretty rugged country there. They get a lot of snow. Um, so easily, I would probably say no during hunting season. Um, I believe best option we have is going to be political. And we're talking of an area 313 to 316, or approximately 700 square miles. And we have data, satellite data, from collars that actually show where the wolves go when they do leave the park in those two sections, in the Lagarda two sections, where they're following the elk herd is what's going on. Um, and I don't even think we need that 700 mile or 700 square miles. I'm thinking, I'm just, this is off the top of my head, it would probably be less than 100 square miles. But you gotta realize there's resistance because people are saying it's Park Creek. The elk being an industry in that area is gonna be upset because uh, we're not killing wolves. Same with the legislative body. That's why we have things that are cooking right now and we're, we're just waiting for legislation to shut down because if they catch wind of it, they'll derail it at that level. So I, th I think it can be done, it needs to be done politically. I think the commission, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission is um, acceptable to it. But we learned through a gentleman who kind of worked with me who was a uh, commissioner that said that, uh, don't bring us a problem, bring us a solution. So there's some work that needs to be done on our end to solve that problem. But I. I do see it coming, and the reason it will come is because of all of you looking at me. That's the only reason we have 313 and 316 to begin with. You know, we, Rick can say, you know, we did this. I can say we did this. Carol can say we did this. No, it's you. It's you applying pressure to the commission, saying, you know what, this is what we want, and we'll get it. Thank you. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, I, I can say a few things. I know those areas well, so. Um, I finished up with the Park Service a little bit over a year ago, and when I was in that capacity, part of my job was to work on um, trying to prevent the park wolves from being habituated to people. Many of the wolves that were killed in 316 were wolves that I knew, the Junction Butte Pack, and of course I knew 926, that's also 9 in the 316 zone she was shot less than a mile from my cabin. So my orientation or my background is working on that issue from the standpoint of when wolves are in a protected area, what, what can people that are wolf advocates, what can be done to lessen the habituation so Wolf like 926, for better or worse, was very comfortable in walking on the paved road in Lamar Valley. She was born there. I knew her as a pup. So it'd be almost like a kid in a quiet neighborhood getting used to playing on a paved street and then not understanding why he got hit by a car. And what I see is that there can be something with a wolf pack, and this seems to be the case with the Junction Butte pack that I call 
situational habituation where they will, they, they need to cross the road at times. So they do the best they can to avoid cars and people, but they kind of have to put up with a, a certain proximity of that. But what I've seen for that pack in particular, when they get away from the road corridor, it, it, it's a different context for them. So whereas they may have crossed the road within a few hundred yards of some people and some cars, I've, I've seen them when they're a few miles away from the road. If they see one hiker, they will probably run away. So they're starting to understand the difference between seeing people in the road corridor and then away from the road corridor, which I think is a critical point because those two zones that you asked about, there's no roads there. So it would be like a kid maybe being taught the issue of stranger danger from their parents. If you're in the playground with your friends and if you see adults walking by at some distance, there's probably no problem. But if you see an adult staring at you, moving towards you, that probably is a problem and get out of there. So um, ever since the beginning of the reintroduction inside the park, we've done what we can to prevent um, that habituation to people. And I personally have done that quite a bit. So I kind of have a different perspective on that of, of looking at the whole issue from that side. And then whatever the legalities, whatever the situation is outside the park, what can an agency like the Park Service do or Wolf Advocates can do to, um, let's say, lessen that issue of the habituation? And I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on that. I, I think we'll also have the, the understanding and the ability to learn those things. So I think a lot can be done. I'm kind of apart from all of the politics just because of my situation. That's changing a bit. But those are just some thoughts on that. So, um, but um, there have been many times where I deliberately have, in my capacity as a park ranger, um, yelled at wolves, banged on the side of my door, did things that, that scare them away from the road so they kind of have an understanding. A wolf like 21 knew how to handle that situation perfectly. He would pick his time to cross, and when there was a break in the traffic, he would go. As an example of his wariness, uh, I write about how one spring, he, he probably had a good 20 pounds of, of meat in his belly. He needed to get back and feed the pups. It was Memorial Day, and there were 300 cars that were just going back and forth. Every time he would try to circle around and cross here, you'd have the cars go like that. I was doing everything I could to try to intervene, and I, I couldn't handle it. So he had to go six miles one way to cross, and then another six miles back. Um, now, the good part of that anecdote is that probably he would have never been shot if he was outside the park because of that wariness. But for the 06 female for 926, they were in another category where they probably actually saw the guys aiming their rifles at them and just stood there not understanding. A way to think about that would be inside the park, we get 4.25 million visitors a year. And um, so Wolf Like 06, 926, others, think of how many times over the course of their life they have people in view and they see something that they become very used to, very familiar with. There's no reason to be concerned about it but a movement by a human that is going something like this, which would be binoculars, a spotting scope, um, camera with a telephoto lens. You all have already thought of the difference between holding up a telephoto lens like this and a rifle. There would be no difference to a wall. So anyway, that's my orientation, what it's like to work on the inside. And I, I have reason to be optimistic that we can make progress in that. When we need to, we call in the law enforcement rangers, and um, they can fire what's called cracker shells, which are kind of like explosive that, that scares the bears. We have um, uh, rubber bullets 
course, we can hit him on the rear end. I'm not sure why, but they always seem to practice on an easy target, which, of course, would be Carter. Um, <laughs> so if you look at his rear end, there's a lot of <laughs> holes there. Yeah. Right, well, thank you, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Carter appreciates that, too. So uh, another Sorry. question? <laughs> Thank you for your question about deterrence. That's what I was going to ask. Um, are they basically? Or in together, they're chasing the prey, and what's happening is there's, I mean, there's an area that's notorious for wolf killings called Deckard Flats, and Deckard Flats is literally, if you go to Hell's a Roaring Outfitting um, Facebook page or web page, he will talk about how Deckard Flats is literally now it's in a national forest. Um, his outfit is three minutes from Deckard Flats walking. So it's literally right there. So what, what I think is happening is today, you know, they bring these people down there because the elk, are, these monster bulls are migrating out of the park. So he brings the hunters there and they shoot the elk. They gut the elk. They take the carcass and the horns out, but they leave the gut pile. And that, so I need to say it, it is baiting and we've argued that point but you have to be receptive to change. And there's just so much pressure from the hunting communities and the hunting organizations that the department is, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is reluctant to move on it. But yeah, that's what's happening. So today they kill an elk, tomorrow they come down, or the next couple of days they come down and they wait for the, the wolves to come to the gut pile. It, boy, it'd be a tough thing to have because the elk want to leave during mm -hmm. the winter. Their food, a lot of their food is better outside of the park, so you tend to see more local wolves would leave too. So I, I don't know how to solve that particular issue. I, another thought, which I, I don't think has been expressed, because I, I like to um, always say that I'm grateful, because it originally was unlimited uh, quotas, in, or no quotas actually, right. in 316 and uh, 313. So I always like to make sure that I, we are saying that we're grateful for that. We have that, so I'm, I'm happy about that. There has been progress made. Uh, do you think that some of these hunters are specifically targeting the alpha animals, specifically the alpha females? I can start by, I can make a few comments and the other folks can join in. There's talk about that, that would be illegal, so if a game warden caught someone, there'd be um, consequences. Um, I'd say it, that could be a possibility, it could be a possibility they are targeting animals. Um, but no, I think most of the time they, they just see a wolf and they have a wolf tag and it's there. You know, it could have been an elk, it could have been something else. It, what do you think, Carter? Um, sometimes I don't think a lot of people are smart enough to do that. And secondly, you know, as we've gone away from the VHF collars, which had real simple frequencies, those would be fairly easy to track if you were you gave it effort. But the GPS collars, they're more unpredictable because depending who's studying the wolves, you can turn them or you you can set them to turn off and turn on. So I know like over in Washington, the packs are working with there, 
they're not always trackable except at certain times depending what the research is trying to find so uh, and then these uh, GPS frequencies too are, are on a different range than the I mean, you're down in the 140, 160 range where the old VHF collars we were using, the federal range was in the 200 to 221 range. So it, it'd be a challenge. You'd have to be kind of a complex person, and some of these shooters aren't that way. Can I just say one, just one thing quickly then? Yeah. Uh, another issue along with what Carter is saying that uh, – there's a tremendous amount of other species that are radio collar now. They're right now in Yellowstone, they're putting backpacks with uh, transmitters on ravens. The golden needles have it. There's way, way, way more elk with transmitters than wolves. So that would be a complication too. So it would, if you were just starting out with that intent, it would be, I think, pretty hard to, to be successful with it. just outside of Yellowstone, and I think some of that relates to collared uh, wolves. Do you want to just address this at all? Um, not sure really what to say about the collars and the non-collars. I know there was a lot of wolves killed in 2012 when 06 was killed, a lot of collared wolves then. Was it seven? I can't remember now. Uh, no, she died in 2012. Yeah, oh, that's what I meant to say, 2012. Mm -hmm. But wasn't there like seven wolves that year with those collars? So it seems like it's come forward since then. I can say to Mark's comment, um, when I showed the wolves that were killed last year in Yellowstone, I said five were killed and one was injured. 1118F's pack, um, they were on a gut pile from what I understand, and somebody shot at them, and a subordinate female was killed, and the alpha female 1118F was shot in the leg. So she's hobbling around on three legs, but everybody calls her a warrior wolf now because she's been getting by all winter, even with her injury, even being all by herself. And in fact, she traveled over 10 miles the other day, wow. from what I understand. All right. It might be worth it uh, just to mention that um, when 926 was shot, she did not have a radio collar. Mm -hmm. Let me Good get point. up here. Yes. So um, this happens somewhat frequently in wildlife research, or what I used to do is uh, we actually got a mortality signal from her collar, but we actually would see her walking around. And so if, the, um, if something goes wrong in the electronics, it can give you a false mortality signal. And then eventually the, the collar fell off and we picked it up. So she was without a collar when she was shot. And I, I, I guess she would be a good example of when we were speaking about a, a habituated wolf. It's very likely that, that she just was watching the guy approach with a rifle and had no particular concern. So I'll go back to, to that issue for me being pretty important, you know, how to figure out how to prevent that type of habituation. Thank you, Rick. I got one more comment, too. Um, if you're radio tracking wolves and continuing to study particular wolves, often be the alphas, breeding pair because they're the you want to call her on at least one of them because they they stay within a predicted territory but if you're a hunter and you see wolves going along and you got time to glass them you're going to pick the biggest animal very often i mean you're trophy hunting i want a big wolf and i think sometimes that corresponds with some of the older animals who doug or others have consistently kept collars on them so it just works out that way that maybe if you pick the biggest one, there's likely a collar on it. Hmm. And that's poor choice coming from the taxidermy angle is that those wolves that wear collars for long periods of time, you know, that hair is worn down. So it's really not a trophy animal, in my opinion, without some doctoring. Okay. So anyway. Okay. Steve, I think. Yeah. Yes, I wondered if you had ever thought of an approach uh, to launch a campaign that would in some way de-escalate this romanticism around killing animals that, that is totally endemic here. Um, and there must be some way that you could use propaganda <laughs> to affect particularly youngsters that might be drawn into this idea that it's wonderful to do target shooting and kill another and kill an animal. Well, who would like to take that? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
That's, you know, that's kind of, Carol, I was thinking about you too. Oh boy, that's a hard one. But I think Project Coyote is doing a great job showing the killing, what's going on when you, when you kill animals. And I think Apex Predator Program is also doing a great job because they're out there in schools and educating kids when they're young. They also have the Little Red Riding Hood book that kids can see and puts wolves in a, in a good light. But yeah, that would be great if we could do some kind of a national campaign to put that front and center. And I, I just real quickly, I want to address this. As I've done this more and more, I, what I've come to realize, this is really a cultural issue. Um, that, you know, we are, it's ingrained in us. I mean, you can go back hundreds, I went all the way back to the Middle Ages in my research to start seeing, you know, where did wolves start getting a bad rap? That's the 1500s. And that was, you, know, you can go back further. So that kind of ingrained hatred is something that, for me, you have to legislate against. You have to give a consequence for acting out. We, we really, you know, laws don't really change people's behavior that much. What it does is it creates consequences. Other people see it and go, well, maybe I don't want to do that, right? But you've got to have a consequence. So for me, this is all about using legislation to start that cultural shift and the example that I would use it would be in dealing with racism how that how that worked and how long that took the next question I actually can I read my own just sure mm -hmm. one. I was going to um, say something to the end I know we'll get into it now um, I'm naturally a very optimistic person I was just born that way and so I tend to um, see things in a positive way mm -hmm. so I do see signs that things are are getting better um, uh, for the um, 23, 24 years in Yellowstone, I've helped people see wolves through my scope, and, and many of those are kids that come from towns that, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, come from towns that, let's say you might consider to be anti-wolf, and um, typically what happens pretty much every time I show the fifth grader, the sixth grader, boy or girl, whatever, let's say it's a boy, um, he looks through the scope, he doesn't see the wolf at first, I say, well, look, look for the big tree, then just to the right, he'll come back, I see, I see it. And then oftentimes we'll turn to his best friend and say, wolves are cool. And you know, what more can you ask for from a, a fifth or sixth grade boy? So I've personally seen thousands and thousands of times what that type of an experience can do. You may be aware that in Yellowstone we have this program called Expedition Yellowstone where they bring kids um, from schools around the country. I've spoken to kids from little towns in, in Wyoming and Montana, Washington, Idaho, towns that you would think would be the most anti-wolf and those are the responses that I get. So. I'm optimistic about this stuff. I, I, we once had a, a group from Harlem, <laughs> and they were the same way too. And um, I, I had asked if I could tell one final story, but I, I think it fits so well into this. I, can I tell it right now? How are we doing on time, Betsy? Ha what? Okay. We have about a half hour? So we're, we're going to wrap the Q&A up at 3.15. So is yeah, I think this is the right time. Um, this happened shortly after the shooting of 06, so it, it was in everyone's mind. And uh, I was on duty. I was in the full ranger uniform with the badge and everything. And I was asked to speak to a um, school group from, I'd rather not say the town, but just say it was from a place that would be considered anti-wolf by most people. And it was the entire school district from this town, which totaled six uh, grades one through eight. <laughs> so the entire thing. And uh, the teachers outnumbered the students. And I think two of them were kindergartens. And I, boy, I don't know too much about kindergarten kids. That's beyond me. They were both were boys. And so the teachers uh, introduced me, and I was ready to do my thing, which I'm pretty comfortable in doing. But before I could say my first word, one of the kindergarten boys just started talking. 
those of you that are parents or teachers may know about that. And, you know, usually it would be, you know, gee, have you seen wolves? Or is there a wolf around here? Are we going to see wolves? That type of thing. It wasn't that. What he said was this, with great excitement. I know the man that shot that famous wolf. You know, he said, female. And I, I know, I happen to know the guy, too. And I'm, I hear that, and I'm thinking, what do I say? I, I couldn't think of anything to say. Um, I was representing the Park Service. As far as we know, she was shot legally. So to say almost anything would get me in trouble, because certainly their parents would ask the kids, what did you do today? Well, the ranger said this, the ranger said that. So I, I, I really couldn't think of a response. I, I wasn't s smart enough um, with this kindergarten boy. And so I'm thinking, well, okay, it's over. I'll tell some stories, maybe about 06, and you know, maybe that will do some good. But before I could even do that, he started talking once more. And now it was way worse because he said, and my daddy just, just bought a license to kill a wolf. So now I'm even in deeper trouble. How, what do you say to that? Um, it was totally legal for his dad to do that. And... You know, in any way, even if any implication on my part, you know, maybe he shouldn't do it or whatever, it, it just wouldn't have been proper in, in my role at that time. So I'm thinking, this is the worst talk I've ever done. And, uh, you know, can I say, okay, no more questions, but there was only one kid, so <laughs> it was pretty, pretty obvious uh, that the kid had me. And I... I just had never been so stymied in my life. And I'm really thinking, this is just a horrible experience. Why am I in this business? And um, I'm thinking, OK, now it's over. I'll do my talk. But once again, before I could start one more time, and this is where I learned my lesson. Because if I had se essentially said, OK, shut up, kid, he wouldn't have told me the third thing. That's what he wanted to tell me. So after saying, I know the man that shot that famous wolf, after saying, my dad, I just bought a license to kill a wolf, this is what he wanted me to know. But I hope he doesn't. <laughs> so think about that. Thank you, Rick. Think about that. And what I'd like to conclude on is the thought this. Somebody had an impact on that boy's life. Might have been Rick. Might have been Mark. Um, might have been anyone. Um, might have been a Bob Landis documentary. Who knows? But um, that's why I have hope. That's why I'm optimistic. Thank you. Somebody else have a mic? Yes, please. Yes, I just wanted to say, as we look at the overall picture of this heartbreakingly colossal issue, I just wanted to make the statement that one option and one of the most powerful tools that we can have in our toolbox is education. And Seacrest Wolf Preserve is a long way from Yellowstone. We're down in the panhandle of Florida, but we are becoming a powerful voice. We are an educational facility based on science, and we are implementing educational opportunities that are changing lives. And Seacrest is a place where wolves and humans connect in nature for educational purposes. But here's my point. If we are going to, to see that this species survives for future generations of Americans, then we are going to have to implement educational opportunities that endears this species to the human heart. Because the greatest habitat of all, and the first and foremost habitat, I feel, in my humble opinion, must be in the human heart. Humans are only going to preserve what they love. They're only going to love what they understand, and they're only going to understand what they are taught. We have children coming through, and I tell the little kids, who wants to be powerful here today? And they all raise their hands, and I say, power, real power, is not killing something just because you can. Real power 
is empowering it to live so that it can do its job for planet Earth. And they say, yeah, that's it. But we're involving children. We're involving our active duty military. We're involving our young people from Florida State University, the University of Florida, the University of West Florida, Auburn University. We're empowering them and raising their awareness. And we mention Yellowstone. We mention Montana, Idaho, Wyoming are huge parts of our educational lectures. We're empowering people to see the whole overall picture, and we are being a voice. We're refusing to accept the things we cannot change, just like so many of you here. And we're working so hard to change the things that we cannot accept. But I personally want to take a moment to thank you, Rick. We empower and sponsor trips out to Yellowstone, and we were there in 2016 and stood there in Hayden Valley when the Wapiti uh, Lake Pack had their pups down by the river. And you spent time with some young people, one of whom was my granddaughter. And then you took us down to your car and had us close our eyes, and you put something under our hands and then said, open your eyes. And it was the paw print lifted out of the park of number 21. And it was so powerful. And we picked up paw prints, and we do that when people exit out of the enclosures after the, the lecture, they put their hands in the paw print, and mm. we say, remember these great wolves. Right. And I want to thank you for keeping these along with all of the other people on the panel. But you, Rick, have encountered hundreds of thousands of people in the park. You've impacted their lives with your humor, with your dedication, with your heartfelt and your soul into this species. And you have generated so much respect and hope for this species, and you have touched so many human lives. And I want to personally say thank you, thank you, and I want you to know that Seagrass Wolf Preserve has donated to the park in your honor and in loving memory of number 21 and 42 and all of the great others, 06, uh, 926, and all the others. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Together, we can make a difference. And I'm honored to be in, the, in this event with all of you great thank giants. You. Thank you for all that you're thank doing. Thank you. I think that's a pretty good way to end the Q&A. Um, and thank you for thanking all these fine folks. Uh, I want to take just a couple minutes here. You know, the, the sub-agenda of this, this year's Sedona Wolf Week is to inform and inspire wolf advocates. So um, I put together just a couple slides here based on <coughs> my experience and on talking with other advocates about what can you do? You know, and these are simple things, and this is a great starting point, but I go back to this list often just to make sure that I'm doing what I can do. Change one mind at a time. Educate yourself, your family, your friends. <coughs> um, years ago, Mary and I stopped eating beef and lamb simply because of the conflict with wolves and livestock. We haven't missed it. That's not for everybody. So you can also eat predator-friendly meats that we talked about yesterday when the ranchers were here. Those are available. You, so you can be, you know, let your stomach be a part of the solution. Um, and when you're talking with other people, you know, this is really important. Listen with empathy to the myths they are giving you. You know, these things come out of their mouth, and you got to listen to them and go, oh, okay, I'm hearing it. That's the myth. And then use facts to debunk those myths. But don't do it in a, oh, you're wrong. You know, it's, it's a conversational sort of thing. Oh, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that, you know, wolves just decimate cattle herds. But, you know, I was looking at these statistics when I was at Sedona Wolf Week, and in Washington, there were eight, ca eight cattle killed out of a statewide herd of a million people. <coughs> that doesn't seem to me like, you know, it's really, you know, decimating the herd. That's an example. It takes time to get to that point, but you can. It's, there's really nothing to that, but you've got to really listen for what are people saying, what's the myth that, that, that you're hearing. I know you've heard this a number of times. Attend hearing, give public comments. If you, so these are kind of in the, in the order that I think are most important. And then, if you can't do that, personally call 
or write legislators. And um, the, really, the personal part is important. Somebody said yesterday that emails that look like form emails don't get counted or get discounted. I've been in FWP meetings where they said, yeah, we've got this petition. It's got 1,300 names on it, 1,300 names on it. We're counting it as one vote. Now, whether you, if you're from out of state and you wonder, should I even do that, here's my belief about that. If you can come from outside of Montana to kill wolves, you can call from outside of Montana to protect wolves. Okay? But you've got to treat others with respect. I think that was the lesson so much that Hillary presented yesterday, the rancher. You know, we've got to really understand that situation and respect the challenges they face and how those fit in with wolf advocacy. You can't discount, oh, I hate all ranchers. And I've been guilty of that, don't get me wrong. Um, and then donate. You know, and, and if I had to, standing right here, you know, pick two organizations to donate, it would be the Center for Biological Diversity and Wolves of the Rockies. You know, but there are others. Personally, when Mary and I, at the end of each year, we make a list of who we're going to donate to. And increasingly, that list has been based on who's going to take these issues to court. But you can, you can select any factor you want. For us, it's court action. I'm going to skip this one because we already talked about the facts. Here's the real key. How do you keep doing it? So connect with other advocates. Hasn't this been a great experience? Huh? Is this rejuvenating or what? I can tell you, man, this is medicine for me. Um, keep learning. Don't stop. You know, there is so much to know about this. You know, we've got people here with years and years and years of experience, and they're still learning. Volunteer. I know that Seacrest runs off of volunteers. Lots of places need volunteers. And it's a good way to get more information about issues. I volunteer with the Bear Creek Council, and I learn so much because we bring in people to speak. You know, find an environmental organization in your neighborhood or in your state or in your county and get in there. Um, you got to envision the changes you want. I'm certainly not original with this. But what is it you really want to change? That's, and then that's what you work toward. And always ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? And this is really important. Am I doing the right thing? I know that I have uh, in my advocacy work and especially in dealing with parties that are anti-wolf, I have not done the right thing sometimes and I always regret it. Direct your anger toward a positive outcome. You know, anger can be a fuel for you as well as it can be detrimental. You know, anger is not real good for our bodies, quite honestly. Um, what it does isn't good, but use it. Direct it toward a positive outcome. By God, that made me mad, and I'm going to focus even more on what I want to see changed. And remember this, change takes a long time. Reward yourself. Visit wildlife and wild lands. And, um, you know, living at the North Gate of Yellowstone, that's pretty easy for us. But everybody has a beautiful place. Everybody. I mean, it could be a city park. You know, it could be a city park to watch crows. I mean, they're cool. I like watching them. Um, we got, we got, I told you the other night, we got to see an otter right down here at the little pond. And this thing about a long time, I'm going to end with this slide because I want you to understand this. 1926, last wolf killed in Yellowstone. Those are the steps that happened before 1995 and 96. And so almost 100 years later, we now have 2,200 wolves in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Washington, Oregon, and California. And to give you a concrete example of this, if uh, Emily would stand up back here at the um, Grand Canyon Wolf Project. Emily looks pretty young, correct? By the time, I was talking to her earlier, by the time the, Me the Mexican gray wolf reaches the recovery goals that are in. There is an actual recovery plan for that wolf. By the time that wolf reaches those goals, if it does, she will be 65 to 70 years old. That's a long time. 
And she told me earlier that when she got this job, she thought, oh, I can take care of this in just a few years. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, and thanks for allowing me to use you. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. We've got a hard stop because we've got to change this room over for the magic show tonight. <laughs> yeah, baby. There's our, one of our magicians. Thank you all.